praise you today and thank you for what you have done for us. And we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Jesus, the hope of the world, my hope and your hope. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful set and arrangement of songs of the season. And we appreciate this praise team leading us, worship team leading us, and helping us to worship the Lord. Luke chapter 2 today, we'll read verses 1 through 21. We're in a sermon series about Christmas, from gloom and fear to salvation and joy, the third part of four. Look, we looked at a passage in Isaiah, the passage in Matthew, and now this Sunday and next Saturday, Christmas Eve, Luke chapter 2, that beloved passage about Jesus' birth. Would you stand as I read Luke 2, 1 through 21? The decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all... ...the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria... And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear." And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. You may be seated. I find birth announcements very interesting. Birth announcements come in a lot of forms. Sometimes you get them through the mail. Sometimes you get them uh, online. A common way that that's done lately is uh, refrigerator cards. You've seen those. Uh, A child's picture with some vital information about the child. I find, I saw one once that gave the child's first and middle name, but not his last name, nor did it tell his parents' last name. And I thought, that's interesting. But people want want others to know the identity of their child. This passage is about identity, the identity of Jesus. 
Identity theft is a major problem today. Here in this passage, the identity of Jesus can't be stolen. The identity of who Jesus was is extremely important for us. Luke sought to inform his readers about more than the birth of Jesus, but also about the identity of Jesus to help us to know who he was and what he came to do. Because Luke wanted to move his readers from gloom and fear to salvation and joy. In the same way for us today, God wants us to understand and respond to the Jesus of Bethlehem, the real Jesus, the one who can make a difference in our lives. Yes, God wants to move us from gloom and fear to salvation and joy. In this passage, in this sermon today, we want to examine some phases of Luke's information to us that help us understand more about Jesus and who He was, what He came to do that help us to uh, move from gloom and fear to salvation and joy. First, we need to understand about Jesus pre Bethlehem. This passage on first sight, may, you may think, well, it's all about what happened in Bethlehem. But no. There are many things here that Luke is giving us that point us not just to Bethlehem, but to pre-Bethlehem. That's caught up in some of the words that are here. First is the word David. Luke wrote that Jesus or Joseph was of the house and lineage of David. And that Bethlehem was the city of David. There's an emphasis in this passage upon Jesus as the son of David. Well, that points us to at least three themes that Luke is trying to convey to us. First, that the giving of Jesus was a planned event. Secondly, that it was God's involvement in it. Thirdly, that it was a fulfillment of God's promises from the Old Testament. First, the idea that it was planned. Though it may look to some that Mary and Joseph, to, from their perspective, this was an unexpected pregnancy, but it was not unplanned at all. God had it planned from eternity. It was a planned event. That ought to help us in understanding and appreciating what God has done for us. It was planned even from eternity. But also we need to see God's involvement in it. There was a registration or a census proclaimed throughout the Roman world where everybody had to go back to their town. Directing Roman to institute that at just the right time in order to put Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem to help fulfill Old Testament prophecy. God at work, God's involvement in it. Joseph and Mary made a trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, the town or city of David. They went to Bethlehem to help fulfill Old Testament prophecy. The Old Testament prophecy of Micah chapter 5 verse 2 that Jesus, a ruler, would be born in Bethlehem. 
Jesus was of the line of David. It helps us to understand that God had been at work for centuries to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, yes, but even before that, even beyond that, Jesus was fulfillment of God's promises to David that there would always be he would always have a son to rule on his throne and that his seed, his house would last forever. That is fulfilled in Jesus. There's a strong connection here to the kings of Judah because of what God had promised to David And then there's the virgin birth. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. uh, Matthew 1 chapter 1 verse 23. Seeing that is fulfilled in what happened in Bethlehem. And there's also the angel's involvement. God involved. God fulfilling Old Testament promises. Jesus, the son of David. But another word that's important here, pre-Bethlehem, is Messiah or Christos. I've tried to emphasize to you that when you see the word Christ, read it Messiah or the Messiah. The word, Greek word Christos is the equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah, the one promised in the Old Testament to help God's people. God's people would be in crisis. And God would promise one who would come in the future in order to help them. For instance, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve had sinned. Man fell, man became in sin. God promised one who would come and crush the serpent's head. In Isaiah chapter 7, one was promised who would be Emmanuel, God with us. In Isaiah chapter 9, a child would be born on whose shoulders the government would be placed. In Micah chapter 5, A ruler would be born. A ruler who would help his people, who would help Israel. Messiah or Christos means anointed one. God's hand upon him for a purpose. Jesus was anointed to be born. He was anointed to die. And he was anointed to rule. The birth in Bethlehem did not just happen. God was at work for the world, for his people, for you. Not an accident, not a sudden decision, but a planned, calculated event from eternity for man's benefit. That makes a difference in how we celebrate Christmas. God was at work. Not something quick. Not something sudden. He didn't buy something for us just off the cuff. He had it planned from eternity. Jesus pre-Bethlehem. But this passage also points us to the identity of Jesus... In Bethlehem. It's interesting to me that the word Jesus is not used in this specific passage until you get to verse 21. The angel told Joseph in Matthew that you will call him Jesus for he will save his people from from their sins. And then in chapter Luke chapter 2, verse 21, at his circumcision, he was named Jesus. I find in that, and and other elements in this passage, an emphasis upon the humanity of Jesus. Now, there's plenty of emphasis in this passage on the divinity 
of Jesus. But there's a strong emphasis here upon the humanity of Jesus. Uh, a study recently came out, a survey of such. Uh, Lifeway Research, our, the research arm of, of our uh, publishing uh, house. In an extensive uh, nationwide survey, they determined that a significant number of people, many of them churchgoers, do not believe that God is, or that Jesus is eternal, or that Jesus was God. Folks, I want to remind you today, don't be among those folks. Jesus was eternal. Jesus was God. He was incarnate God. He was the second person of the Trinity, the second person of the Godhead from eternity past through eternity future. Jesus was eternal and Jesus was God. But yet in this passage, there's much made of His humanity because He was both in Jesus, both God and man. Look at some of the elements here that point to His humanity. I think about the humanity and the realness of Joseph and Mary. Put yourself in the place of this young couple. Real folks, just like you, or maybe just like you 30, 40, 50 years ago for some of us. But a real young couple, the Lord Jesus for us, helping us. When my family was younger, as a part of us teaching our children about the Bible, one of the things we did was acted out some of the things. Uh, this one was an insistence from my daughter, who was two or three years old at the time. She wanted to act out this story. So she'd get a doll, stuff it under her shirt, and she'd coerce big brother, three years older than her, to participate. She'd put a towel over his head, make him look very funny. So she would be Mary and he would be Joseph. But to act this out, they had to have a part for dad. Guess what part dad played? Dad was the donkey. <laughs> We'd start at one end of the house and... She would get on dad's back, dad down on his all fours, and big brother holding on to her, making sure she didn't fall off. And, and we would make our way from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, and there Jesus would be born. There's several things you need to know about that. One is you're not going to get any videos. They probably don't exist anymore. It's been a while. But the other thing I want to highlight for you, where in this passage does it say there was a donkey? It doesn't. It doesn't. Now, what do we make of that? I don't know what to make of that. It could be that Mary and Joseph were so poor they couldn't have, didn't have one. Or they may have had one. We don't know. It just doesn't tell us one way or the other. We do know that Joseph was a carpenter, a working man. They were common folks. Very real, real people. Just like us. Note how that Mary and Joseph were in subjection to the authorities. They had to do what the Romans told them to do. Even though she was nine months pregnant, they had to make the trip to Bethlehem. 
passage says she was with child. This was a real pregnancy. The time came. There was a real gestation period. There was a real development of the embryo to a child that was full term. There were labor pains. The passage says she gave birth. This was a real birth like any other human being. But there were no epidurals, no spinals back then. Jesus was born as a baby. A helpless, dependent newborn. Last week we emphasized the conception of Jesus. God became an embryo inside of Mary. Here, nine months later, God became a baby. Can you imagine that? The eternal God, forever God, the creator God. The God of all time and of all space. The God of of everything there is. Suddenly became a baby. Being held by a young mother. Being held and placed in a manger. A real, real baby. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He had need of warmth and protection. Yet eternal God. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to point you to the realness of Jesus. Yes, fully God, yet fully man. God. Incarnate. One of us. To become one of us. To help us. This passage says that Uh, They placed Jesus in a manger. They laid him in a manger, verse 7. And then the angels said uh, to uh, the shepherds that they would go and find Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, an older translation does not do a very good job of punctuation there. And it sounds like, and this people made a big deal out of this at one time, Uh, Made it sound like shepherds, you will find Mary and Joseph and the baby all lying in a manger. Some folks couldn't figure that out. Well, I grew up on a farm. A manger is a feed trough. We had lots of feed trough, plenty big enough for a whole family to get in. That wouldn't be a problem. We had one feed trough, six feet wide and 90 feet long. But no, they place Jesus, the baby, in a small feed trough probably. Again, pointing to his realness, his humanity. What am I trying to say to you? Jesus was real. God did something incredible. God became a real person in Jesus. God entered humanity in order to help us. To help do something for us. What is the significance of that? Only a God who identified with us as a human being who would come and become one of us, could go to the cross to die for us. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice because he identified as God and as man. He was God. He was man, yet without sin, so he could go to the cross to die for us. So this passage emphasizes who Jesus was pre-Bethlehem and in Bethlehem, but also post-Bethlehem. There are some other words in this passage that point us 
to whom Jesus would be in the future, what he would do post-Bethlehem. One of those words is Savior. Last week we emphasized this word. It's a very significant word in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's about being a rescuer, a deliverer. Someone who saves someone from great peril. Like a military deliverer or a medical deliverer. Jesus came as a rescuer, a deliverer from sin. Since Genesis chapter 3, man has had his forever big problem of sin. Adam and Eve sinned against God. They disobeyed God. And the Bible teaches us that because of that, sin entered the human race. Sin entered humanity's experience, thus bringing death, sickness, sin, destruction into our lives. And since Genesis 3, sin has been causing death and destruction every cent, lives being torn apart, and humanity being wrecked. Mankind separated from God because of sin. But Jesus came to save us from that problem. To rescue us from that problem. A problem that man could not solve himself. A problem that would crush mankind. A problem that mankind would would spend eternity separated from God because of. Jesus was sent as a Savior. His job, His birth, a part of that process, led Him to the cross. Led Him to the cross that He might be our Savior. Isaiah chapter 45 verses 21 and 22 say this. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. God, the Savior, declared declared Himself that in the Old Testament. God became Jesus to be our Savior, to save us from our sin. 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 4, verse 14 The apostle wrote this, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. My friends, today we have a Savior because of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Yes, we celebrate Jesus was to be he could die for us the only way that Jesus could die for us to help us was if he were fully God fully man sinless and God would place on him our sin Jesus came to be the Savior but also this idea of post Bethlehem Who Jesus would be in the future is tied up in the word Christos or Messiah. Again back to verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord or the Messiah the Lord. Again the one promised in the Old Testament to help God's people. A Messiah was 
one that would help people in all, practically all cases in the Old Testament. A Messiah would help the people out of an immediate crisis, but would help them in the future as well. Our Messiah, the Messiah Jesus, came to help us in the present, but also to help us in the future. Think with me. Yes, we're going to celebrate Jesus about Christmas. But Jesus, the Christ child, the Messiah, came to help us in the present now. He gives us life and life abundant, life that's whole, life that's forgiven, life that is uh, made whole in Him. In the present, but yes, there's more to come. God, who became flesh in Jesus, the Messiah, is going to help us in an even greater way in the future. He will return. He will establish His kingdom. There will be no end to that kingdom. He will gather His people around the Lord Jesus to worship Him forever. And we will be those gathered around Him. Yes, Jesus came to Bethlehem, but He's about a whole lot more than just Bethlehem. He's about something post Bethlehem as well. Another word of importance that points us to post Bethlehem is the word curios, our Lord, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, Messiah, the Lord. A baby, yes, but the Lord. Three main backgrounds of this word in Scripture. It was the, the master of a slave or the emperors, the Greek and Roman emperors called themselves curios, trying to put deity and supremacy upon themselves. But it's also used in association with Yahweh, Yahweh God of the Old Testament. Yes, the baby born in Bethlehem was Yahweh God Himself. A baby, yes, but a master, a supreme one, a sovereign ruler, Yahweh God Himself. The Apostle Paul would write later, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Curios. And believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. You shall be saved. Same Apostle Paul would write later in, a, in Philippians chapter 2. Because Jesus went to the cross, in obedience went to the cross... Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that's above every name to which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Curios. Jesus. God himself. Jesus the Lord. In Acts chapter 5, Peter would preach that Jesus was a prince and a savior. We sang earlier about the prince of heaven. Yes, Jesus always has been the prince of heaven. And he always will be the prince of heaven. And one day those who know him, those who've been forgiven of our sins because he's our savior, will gather around him in heaven forever to worship and love him forever. What a beautiful thing. Jesus, a baby, was born. But yet he came for so much more 
than a starlit night in Bethlehem. What a great Savior, great Christ, great Lord He is. Here in just a few days, most of us will follow family traditions and we'll gather and exchange gifts or give gifts to one another. I want you to think about Jesus and what He's done as a gift. In Romans 6, 23... Paul wrote that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is Jesus Christ our Lord. God has given us the greatest gift out of mercy, grace, and love, given us a precious, mighty gift in the Lord Jesus. If He is all that we say He is, if He's Savior, if He's Messiah, if He is Lord, how should we respond? What should we do with Him? Yes, we should celebrate Him at Christmas, but yet we should live for Him every minute of every day, every second of every minute. And we should do all that we can to obey Him and follow Him and help others to know Him and help them to follow Him as well. What a great gift He has given. Let's bow together, please. Father, help us today. Thank you for Jesus such a great and wonderful gift. Father, help us as we sing, as we respond. Father, I pray that you'll help us. Father, that we'll worship Jesus, but Lord, that to worship Him is so much more than just a baby in Bethlehem. May He be our all, our everything. We yield ourselves before you in Jesus' name. Amen.